All right, everybody. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, wherever you're at. I am here live with Peter Schultz, um, game designer, artist, I think even author. You've written some stuff as well? Oh, uh, at first, Heil. <laughs> And take my apologies that I am not an English native speaker. So uh, um, to answering your question, yes, I wrote the whole world for the Sorcerer and wrote additional worlds for other games. So um, mainly I am I am a world builder. Then I provide an illustration for this world. And at the last and not least, I am designing the game also. Yeah, yeah and, and beautiful artwork. One of the things I really love about the game is that dark and and gothic style artwork that you have um i don't think there's a lot of games out there besides maybe like a, an eldritch horror or something like that that yeah. kind of capitalizes on the horror theme yeah thank you very much um i think that uh the main the main mindset to create a world of sorcerer as far as i remember because it's like seven years ago uh, so was that I, I want to I want to design a world or create a world uh, with a uh, with a Victorian era horrors and it will not be a tool thing and it will not be a steampunk because each and every time uh, or 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 mostly when I see a horror theme in the Victorian Victorian um, theme. Um, or or how to say setting, it's mainly a steampunk thing. Or yeah, it's mainly steampunk because Tulu is, I think, in the Prohibition era in the US. Mm -hmm. So uh, so yeah, I, I'm not a huge fan of the steampunk. Uh, so I do not, I I just do not include this this these things into into this game. So yeah, yeah, that's the that was the main reason when I start to create the, the world of Sorcerer. Yeah, and the other thing I'll say I, I like quite a bit too is all of these different um, characters, uh, the sorcery types, um, the locations, all of them have basis in actual mythology from around the world, um, which I yeah. thought was very cool. Some of, these, some of these minions, you can look up the name of them and you can kind of find some of the background on that particular creature in in myth mythology. Yeah, I was I was I always loved the. Uh, it's not a secret. I'm a huge fan of Assassin's Creed. I don't know uh, IP of the Assassin's Creed IP. And what I really love on the Assassin's Creed is they are they are um, that took some uh, some part of our history or at least the facts that we know about the, this period. And try to find some holes in it, and they fulfill the holes uh, with the with the story of the Assassin's Creed IP. And I think that was a brilliant idea. So I was thinking about it. I can do something similar with with the Sorcerer to. I love when the games also have an uh, educative educative. I don't know if it's the right term, but uh, the people get educated somehow. Uh, so, so, so I start to use the, also the historical uh, uh, characters. Like, for instance, the first thing that comes into my mind is, of course, Sigismund II, which is the new one. Uh, he is the descendant of the of the of the Sigismund, uh, and, uh, uh, and, yes. and and both are from the Draconic Order. And from this order also came the the Vlad Tepes, so uh, the Count Dracula. Uh, yeah. Uh, and and I used Count Dracula also in the Virgilio uh, Virgilio storyline uh, when uh, they both were in the Turkish prison. And those are the minor things that I used for, uh, at one place and another uh, to to bring the story together and to connect it somehow with our own history. And um, I'm always telling that it's not particularly necessary to create a new world when our world has such a beautiful folklore, mythology, and legends, and historical facts that there is a plenty of space to to provide people a huge world based on our own. 
So, so that was the main mindset of it. Yeah. For and me, I it's... Also... Oh, yeah. sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, and, 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 and at final, I also using uh, lit, literature, literature, Jesus, just uh, some of the, some of the words, <laughs> a huge problem. So I am using like, a, like a Midsummer Dream. Uh, there is an Oberon and all, all the things around him. And there is also, uh, there is also using the materials from the Dante's Inferno. All are, of course, public domain. Uh, so I am using it in my own fashion. Uh, so you can uh, the whole hell thing, like 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 the demonologist has some of the mo of the arch demons, like the mammon. Yes. Uh, those arch demons are are something like uh, like uh, arch demons of the of the cycles of the hell. So I am using the cycles of hell that Dante wrote for his Inferno work. Uh, um, and I am using also uh, also the forests of the hangman, which is the forest of the hangman. It was uh, it is a part of the hell that Dante's wrote about. Uh, and Merlin, the character, the new character, which is basically something like a tree folk, uh, he came from that uh, from that part of the hell, and he basically turns into the tree and he came back as a tree. Yes. So there's just a few things that I'm using. So I'm using the literature, uh, which I consider great uh, to be to be greatly fitted into the into the setting. Also the folklore, worldwide uh, legends, and the historical facts. Ooh, and that's it. <laughs> and my own fantasy, of course. Yeah, yeah. To me, it's got a uh, feeling for for people who are fans of the the TV show um, Supernatural. It's got that oh, kind of I feel where, where they, they're, my way we're done. they're 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 constantly doing where they tap into lore and and things oh, yeah. like that and and then kind of putting their own spin on it to bring it into their their story or their fictional world. Yeah, there was a time that I I watched the show like daily and the, the, I think Dean and Dean and the second I don't know uh, but I I was yeah. a huge fan of the supernatural. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the game, I don't know how many people are going to watch this, and maybe they don't know anything about Sorcerer or Sorcerer Endbringer. Tell us first a little bit about Sorcerer. Obviously, we'll be looking at it a little bit later on TTS, um, but what that game's all about, and then tell us a little bit about Endbringer. Okay, well, it's it's a huge question. Uh, I don't know in which scale uh, you want to provide this answer, uh, but if if it needs to be briefly described, it's a card game at first. It's it's the sorcerer is a is a hybrid. It's from one part the card game uh, in old fashioned like the like I, I'm a huge fan of the CCGs and TCG card games, which right now there are only few of them and uh, many of of those ga games are already not supported or as we said that um so it, i i designed it in this fashion so uh, so if you are if you are a fan of the old collectible card games and trading card games i think you will be uh, you will you will easily handle the sorcerer gameplay uh so so it is a card game it's non tradable card game but it's expendable card game. That means that when you will buy the the, the big box, I mean the core box of the Sorcerer, not speaking of Edmund right now, only speak about Sorcerer, which is already out there. You will have all the sets of cards necessary to play it. And this game is not a pay to win. That means that you are not buying a random boosters and who will get better cards, will have a better combination and will have a better chance to win. No. This game is not designed this way. This game is designed that that it has a booster pack, but it is a booster pack in that fashion that you will buy it, open it, and you can and you have a whole set of cards necessary to bring this set into game, and it cannot be adjusted. So all the sets are fixed. So speaking of it, as you can see right now on the Rick screen that is sharing. He has a separated on the light uh, on the on the on the on the left side the character, the lineage, and domains. 
And those are the set of cards that I told you. In the core box, you have a four characters, four lineage sets, and four domain sets. And at the start of the game, me and my opponent will, will pick up one character, one lineage, and one domain and shuffle them up. And that's the, that's the setup of your deck. There's not a huge setup in this game. So we will just pick three decks, shuffle them together, and you can start to play. Uh, speaking of a versus system, that means that me against an opponent, against a human opponent. And you will see the gameplay as we will play it. But basically, we need to, we need to, we need to defeat, we need to conquer the battlefields. There are three battlefields that we are struggling on it. And we need to take control of the two. If we conquer two battlefields, we win. The one who conquered two battlefields will win. Each battlefield has its own defense value. So if you, will, if you see, there is, uh, there is a value from 8 to 12. So each of those battlefields have 12 defense value. When the defense value drops to zero, uh, you lose the battlefield. So your opponent take control of it. And in the moment that you will take control of the second battlefield, the game immediately ends. Exactly. Um, uh, that's the point of the game. That's the point of the game. During the gameplay, you will play cards. You will, you will play minions on these battlefields. And there will be battle going on on these battlefields. So that's the that's the main uh, how to say description of the game. That's the main flow yeah. of the game. And yeah, Endbringer, and of course, oh, that, sorry. Uh, uh, okay, the game is using dice. So when the minion is attacking, you are using special dice. Uh, so th that was really necessary part of it. Uh, so that's the that's one of the things that bring this game to a whole unique level which is the second part of the game because as i said is a hybrid of two different uh of two different how to say style of games mm -hmm. at first one it will provide you a card game experience so you are combining cards trying to get the good combos good synergies and on the other hand there is a tabletop skirmish feel of the game in the battle and in that fashion, it is using dice. So when a minion is attacking, you are rolling custom dice. And there is a mechanic of, of hit points, which are distributed by your opponent. So when I am attacking and I get a hit points, I will give, uh, I will give uh, this pool of hit points that I evaluated during attack to my opponent. And it's up to him how, you, how he will distribute uh, this damage among his minions slash battlefield. So this is very important thing. Many people told us that this game that they are not feeling frustrated during the gameplay, even if they lose the game. Mm -hmm. And this is the main reason. That's the main mechanic of the game where people are not as frustrated. Okay, it depends on the people. Okay, if you need to, <laughs> if, if you need to win in any in anything possible in uh in any mean necessary so uh, you will be angry of course uh but normally people that want to enjoy it are not as frustrated because they are managing this damage evaluation one uh one of my friends uh which is a huge euro game he's a huge euro gamer and he gave this game a chance because it's my friend uh, but on the other side, he's a very constructive person. And he told me that he felt he feel in that part of the game, like the damage distribution, a euro feel. So basically, he is distributing and managing the damage that he earned during the gameplay. I do not, uh, I do not look at it in this way, but after that a remark of him, it has something in it. I mean, okay, so... So there is a damage distribution, there is playing cards, and I think, Rick, that's it, is it? Yeah. What do you think? 
Yeah, yeah, I, I like that. And and I'll say when you were talking about this being kind of in the realm of collectible card games, one of the things I like is I never really got into magic because I didn't really like deck building. And what I love about Sorcerer is that I'm doing deck building, but on a very more, I guess you'd say macro type scale, instead of yep. picking individual cards that I'm going to put into my deck, I'm picking yep. three decks and I'm smashing yeah. them up together. So yes. each of those decks has a certain theme or mechanic to them. And that makes it easier for me. I, I enjoy yeah. doing that. Because yeah. then I don't and have to think you... about every card and how many cards I want of it in my deck. I just pick yes. three decks, smash them together, yes. I'm ready to go. And the important thing is that those decks are pro level. <laughs> Do you know yeah. what I mean? That, yeah. uh, that you already have a good decks. Because in the Magic the Gathering, I, I, I am a... I played Magic like 20 years. Uh, in in few in in few periods that I didn't play, but at all I am playing Magic 20 years. I stop it. Uh, but I have I am I, I was a huge Magic fan, and I can tell uh, I can tell uh, that to have a good Magic debt, you need to spend. A huge amount of money. Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Somebody, thing. somebody can tell me that no, it's not a true because there was decks that was really uh, cheap and so on. Okay, but we are speaking right now at the pro level. Yes. Uh, and I find out that those vanilla decks that you can buy for cheap are not as enjoyable as the decks that are really synergized and based on the better cards. Uh, but that's only from my point of view. Of course, there are exceptions of it, okay? Mm -hmm. But speaking at whole, uh, Sorcery is designed to be that each deck is just working perfectly and is designed to be as much synergized as it can be. So there is nothing like a cheap card. Each card is basically a mythic card. I mean the rarity, hey? okay? So each card is a... Perfectly playable. There is nothing like bulk cards. That's important on it. Yeah, yeah, and 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 the thing is too that that's great is again if you're like me and 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 you're new to this game, you don't have to know too much about the cards. Just pick three decks, smash them together, you're good to go. As you play more, you'll learn a little bit about what each deck presents. But there's this okay. infinite replayability in that there's all these different combinations especially if you get the expansion content like you were yeah. saying the base game comes with these four yes. four characters four lineages and four i think four domains for the base yes yes but then you see all these others below here that if either they were extras with the original sorcerer game that you could get or now mm -hmm. with endbringer which we're going to be talking about there's all these extra additional characters uh, lineages and domains and when you get to this level here holy mackerel the amount of combinations you can make is insane so it i i think that's i think that's a really cool aspect of it is how much how much variability you can have in this game yeah yeah and and from my experience uh with of course other players not only my friends I'm, i i play with a lot of people you can only imagine um so what I really love is that when somebody built a deck of those, so basically he will, he will pick up one character, one lineage, and one domain, we usually get into second game with the same deck. So, so after the first game, they, they just start to, 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 to understand what the deck is about and uh, what combinations he can, he can do to make it even more synergized and and that's the replayability that that is that is awesome because you can play with one deck like maybe like a week you can have a 10 10 games with the same deck and you will be perfectly mastering it and then just check out all those possibilities that you have in future so uh yeah the the yeah the game is getting bigger and bigger and i am pretty satisfied with the content right now yeah, and, I, and I love the fact. Make, oh, sorry. Go ahead. It, yeah, just to make it more, uh, just to correct you, uh, the stuff that you showed us, um, I should not call it Endbringer because it's not a part of the Endbringer. 
Uh, it's something like a wave two, which was the part of the Endbringer campaign, but it's not a part of the Endbringer game because Endbringer is a standalone box that did not have any set in it. So if you want to play an Endbringer, uh, you need to have at least a base copy of the game. Not yeah. at least, you need to have the base yeah. copy of the game <laughs> because you need all the components to play Endbringer. Right. It was a it was a decision. The, it, we we think about it with Rob, uh, how to deal with the Endbringer. There was a there was a uh, there was a one one mindset on the table that the Endbringer will have also the playable sets and components necessary to play it, which will which will make it a standalone game. Mm -hmm. It is good idea, but we find out that what about players that are do, that do not love the cooperative gaming? Right. Yeah. And, uh, but they are huge fans of the Sorcerer, and they really want to have the new sets of cards. But they do not care about the Endbringer content. They do they they do not need to buy everything to just get three or six sets. So that decision come clear, and we and I get a more space to design more things in the Endbringer box. Yes. Yeah, and and. We haven't talked too much about Endbringer, but essentially Endbringer is a way to take the original PvP Sorcerer game and play it in a solo co-op, non-campaign environment. They're just single scenarios you play, but yes. it, it it works the same with some of these these big bosses that you're going to be fighting against as you would with the uh, original decks where you're going to take one of these decks and you're going to mix it with one of these decks and then you're going to mix it with one of these and that's then your boss and and they'll have their own unique combination of cards. Well, I should I should I should name the Endbringer a boss battler. Yes. It's a boss battler. Uh, so if you know games like uh, Aeon's End, which I am a huge fan of by the way, mm -hmm. uh, it is a boss battler game. So you will pick up one boss uh, I don't think if if there is a scenario card, but nevertheless, it's a boss battler game. But it has some story in it because uh, when you will pick up in the first row, as you see on the screen right now, in the first row there are four oversized cards, and those oversized cards are the nemesis. Uh, so so it's basically the big the big character on the on the uh, on the punch board that you can see. Uh, they are uh, they are twice or or thrice the size of the of the sorcerer avatar standees. So those big monsters are taking two battlefields. We will get into uh, when we will start to play. And uh, each of those each of th each of the nemesis has its own action deck, which is basically its uh, AI deck. At first, when when you check the campaign of the sorcerer and bringer. Basically, those decks aren't there. Uh, so when the Kickstarter campaign uh, ends, I came to Rob and tell him, Rob, even we are we have it tested and we are satisfied with the gameplay, I need to expand it even more further. I need to have the the nemesis to have each separate deck. Which means, Rob, it will give us additional contact and not cheap contact to add into the game, which is already farmed. What is amazing and why I really enjoy to work with Rob is that in a response, he gave me that answer. Peter, if you see that this will help a game a lot, go for it. We will give this content to people for free. Nice. So, so all those action decks are the uh, are the things that was designed after the campaign to get a game even more, uh, even more story driven. Even each and avatar have a lot more space to, uh, to 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 have a lot of actions because mainly it was designed that the avatar, uh, the nemesis, has the same mindset as the as the. Uh, as the archetype deck, it means that you will draw um, you, you will draw uh, a color or a symbol, and he do four of separate things. With this deck, 
there is more than 20 cards in it, I think. And each and every card, excluding, okay, several copies of few of them, has each uh, has their own effect. So the action deck is pretty versatile and the game do not feel repetitive. Yes. Then there are the... Uh, th- those are the Nemesis decks. So, plus, uh, so basically when, when you as a player will do the action, which, we, which you can see in the gameplay, Nemesis respond to it with this card. And he will do this action. So if you have this, uh, this card right now, we can, just, uh, we can just go through anatomy of the card. So Boiling Blood is the name of the card. Generate two hate counters is the effect during the action phase. Then there is a type of the of the of the of the card. So basically, this is a sorcery card. Then there is a flavor text. Uh, kudos to Rob because I asked Rob because I'm not a native speaker to add some pretty flavor to the card, and I'm pretty happy what he did with it. And uh, then there is a symbol which uh, on the card you can see this white symbol with those scratches. This will correspond to the archetypes decks during the battle. And then there is a critical effect on the on, on the on on the bottom of the card, and that's it. Yep. Um, so there is uh, then there are the archetype decks. Archetype archetype uh, sets will give you a card with the tactics that you will use during the battle. So during the game, normal the game normally the game of sorcery consists of two. Each, each round, the game is separated into two something like acts. The first thing is the act of the card game. Uh, I'm not using right now the, the terminology of the game, okay? I'm just telling it from my perspective, from my mindset of the gameplay design. So the first act is a ready, a ready phase, where you are preparing for the battle and you are going vice versa. So... You are doing something, then your opponent doing something, and so on. And this is tracked by the actions. And when when the threshold of the action is fulfilled and nobody has actions, the battle will start. And that's the second act each round. That's this battle, which is a, basically a skirmish tabletop war game like Warhammer, without the minis. So you are chucking dice, evaluating damage, and you are not playing any cards in most cases because in the new and bringer wave to content there are some lineage or sets that can play cards during the battle but this is an exception to the main rule yeah okay so during the battle you are using tactics and to present it on the ai this archetype deck has a list of tactics that uh that his minions is using during the battle and Oh, what about the minion? So archetype will give you a deck of minion cards that he will spawn each round. So basically, as you can see, those soulless guys has their own mechanic, and uh, there are four of them. There are some there are some uh, undead creatures with the dead dealer. Um, uh, that one is a horseman, by the way. Each of those decks has a horseman of apocalypse. Um, so the Endbringer is something, some variant of the of the Ekatlon, of the of the uh, of the Apocalypse of the Ragnar, uh, not Ragnar, of the of the Gehenna, um, and so on. So basically, it's the end of the world, uh, or or the or the escalation before the end of the world. And each of those four decks had some has a horseman in it. So basically, the the when you will check when you will take the Nemesis deck. You will get your skin or 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 the or the creature that it is. But then you will um, you will pick up what what is his archetype in this endbringer uh, and in this end game. So basically, when you will check uh, when you will take one of the nemesis, you will give him an archetype. An archetype you can be a dead dealer. You can be the demiurge. You can be the hellraiser. And basically, those are some representation of the four horsemen of apocalypse. Uh, so basically, when you will see uh, Hellraiser is is a conquest. Uh, then there is a then there is a dead dealer, which is the death. Uh, then there is a plague bringer, which is the which is plague. And uh, the fourth one, 
the fourth one is always uh, in our history, or how to say, uh, yeah, in our history, there, there, the, the horsemen were, were uh, adjusted based on the period in, in which the world was. So during the during the during the middle uh, during the Middle Ages, uh, there was the fourth horseman was a famine. But right now, worldwide, we are not uh, we are not uh, decimated with the famine. So I was thinking, what what uh, if, if the world will end in the in the 18th century, if, which, uh, which is the which is the century in which the uh, sorcerer is being uh, uh, is happening is is the alternative history, of course. Uh, what kind of the fourth horseman world be? And this is the demiurge. Demiurge is 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 a rebirth. So the fourth source, uh, the fourth uh, horseman of the uh, of the endbringer of the apocalypse right now is the demiurge, which will brings a rebirth. So the, so the humanity must die, and and the new one will be re and the new breed of creatures will came after us. So. Therefore, there is a demiurge. And the last thing, there is the scenario cards, which we will, I think, will not, uh, or should be used. I, I, I recommend Rick to use a, to, to use a scenario <laughs> card. Uh, you, you, you did not play with the scenario, right? Correct, yeah, in our game the other so day. We will, just, uh, we, we, will, we will definitely go for it. So we will take up the, the is leading the invasion, so you will see uh, what scenario will bring into the game. Yes. Uh, so the scenario is basically what we, what he will do, or, or, what, or the war, what these uh, nemesis want to achieve. So particular here is leading the invasion. Okay. So yeah, and that's 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 the thing, Rick. If you will have something to add, just go on. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you so much for that overview. Um, if one last question before, because I know we were gonna, one of our goals was to kind of guide you through. How to how to use the TTS application, oh, yeah. but before we go there, for anybody who's curious about getting the Endbringer contact, Sorcerer the original game is available at your local retailer, or you can get it online. But Endbringer, um, that is something that's still in the process of production, I believe. If somebody wants to get a hold of that, what's the best way for them to pre-order or eventually get a hold of the Endbringer content? Um. Yeah. Uh, was there any question, Rick? Sorry. Oh, I, yeah. I sorry. If if there's somebody listening and they're really interested in the Endbringer co-op okay. solo, is that available for pre-order right now? Is it going to be something they'll have to kind of wait on since the Kickstarter was uh, quite a while ago? I'm pretty sure. I am pretty sure you can pre-order it directly from uh, uh, from our web page, which is wisevisitgames.com. Or from Endbringer Endbringer page directly. Yeah. Excellent. So and I and I think uh, you, I, I will just check it right now uh, to to be to to provide you a correct answer. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, I cannot see it because uh, it asked me to view my pledge. <laughs> So yeah, I, I don't know, can, uh, uh, I but I think, but right I think yes, you can you can definitely pre-order it, and you can also get a Kickstarter exclusive content from the last uh, from the last Kickstarter, and I am pretty sure that you can also get any other exclusive content for our uh, for our other products, which is Hero Realms, Star Realms, and Epic. Uh, so that's the policy of our company that during each Kickstarter. You are able to get the promo things from the past Kickstarters, which I really love about it. Yeah. Well, I'm on the site now. It looks like you can you can buy Sorcerer now. I I'll have to look a little bit more. Maybe I can put some comments eventually in the, oh, in yeah. the video. Sure. But, sure, sure. but yeah, thank you so much for that overview. Um, I I've only played Endbringer a couple of times. I played it solo. I played mm -hmm. it co-op with one person, and now I get to play it co-op with Peter in just a moment. And I'm, I'm not as afraid of putting the scenario cards in there because I've got you to kind of help me make the best choices <laughs> that uh, I may have not been making oh, before. Uh, 
well, uh, Rick, uh, we will definitely play it as it was designed. <laughs> it was designed with a scenario. So when you are putting out the scenario, you are uh, you are just to make the game a little bit easier. Uh, but uh, if we have a chance to play together, just play it as it was designed. Yeah, and I, and I will add that one conversation Peter and I were having after we did the co-op is this this is a is this is a game that has is meant to really challenge you and really oh, yeah. put you through the ringer. Um, yeah. I think I think you use Dark Souls as as, as an example of the inspiration yeah. behind this. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, that's that's exactly the the mindset. The I really love challenging games. Uh, I I always tell that it's not important to win but to lose. Um, so so there is a chance to win this game, but the chance is really slight. Uh, of course, there are uh, Rob provides some adjustments. He is a brilliant designer, of course. And uh, I tell him to to manage this on his own. Uh, my default design was um, that you will you will just uh, you will need to find out and and this is true also when you will play easier models or uh, or something um, something easier than than the default design uh, is that the there is a very simple mindset. You need to master the game. Uh, so it's nothing like you need to deep dive a bit more to beat and bring your content. Uh, so it's it's more rewarding for the people that play more games than one or two or three. Uh, so it's not easy to beat. And I think when you are playing the first time, it's impossible to beat. Uh, yeah. If you do this, kudos to you. But <laughs> even the more experienced players will not beat it at first try. And me as a designer, I am always looking for the games that I can beat in first try. When I will beat the game in first try, I am I'm not sure if I want to play it again in in this setup that in the same setup. So yeah. so therefore I really love the challenging games and very hardly to beat up. And when you are not uh, when when you are not familiar in in sorcerer in what you what kind of deck are you playing and mostly what deck is opposing you so it's not not need to know only your deck you need what your opponent has its mm -hmm. own, uh, is bringing on the table and in endbringer the mindset is there so you need to find out what the your what your opponent is trying to do to you mm -hmm. and how and how you can defend yourself and that's the thing that you need to find out and you you cannot find it during the, the the first gameplay you need to master the gameplay you need to master your deck and if your deck seems too weak against particular uh particular set that you created so if there are there are there are deck of or set of cards which can easily handle the situation. So the endbringer is something like a like experience to player. When you will buy a a, a, a box of the sorcerer and then the endbringer, you need to deep dive into the game. <laughs> that, that's, the, that's the point of it. I am I am a huge fan of deep diving into games. I, I I am 30 years old and I am playing games since the 90s. And then when uh, at, at that times when I bought some game, I go deep down into it and I play it a lot more than three or four times. Uh, right now, of course, the mindset of the or the tiles of the board gaming is has changed. This is something like a horde, uh, like a, a horde of heaven. So I will play game two times and then I need a new game. Yeah. With the Endbringer, you need to deep dive a bit at it, and but but at the end of the day, you will be rewarded by this. Yeah. So you need to find out what combination is good against each boss or or nemesis. Sorry. Uh, okay, I can I can call it boss, so it's it's better to me to. So uh, you will find out uh, what 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 set is is better for the uh, to beat the boss. So basically, you can you can adjust adjust the difficulty on your own.
So yeah. if you will know if you will know the the environment of the sorcerer, that means that if you know the sets and if you know the 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 bosses, you can adjust the game as you want as you can fit. So the more you will play it, the more rewarding the experience will be. And that's the mindset of it. And this mindset came from the Dark Souls. The more you grind, the, the more you grind it, the more you play it, the more you experience it. It will give you some very, uh, how to say, very rare feeling. And I really love this feeling. And of course, I am doing games for myself mainly. <laughs> so, so yeah, that that's that, that that's correct. Yes. Yeah. And I I found you know I know talking to the designers of Dice Drone too. That's kind of their mindset. They design games that they've designed Dice Drone as a game that they want to play. And I think of when course. a designer is passionate about the game and they're designing something that they want to play, it's going to be a better game because of, because of that. One wise, one wise person once told me, Peter, design the game for yourself because if nobody will play it, at least you will play it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, what we'll do now, um, we'll go ahead and kind of walk you, Peter, and, and everybody who's watching. If you're not familiar with Tabletop Simulator, we're going to kind of give a quick tutorial. And then once we've gone through that quick tutorial, what we'll do is we're going to give a shot at Endbringer. And we'll see uh, see how we can do against one of the, the nemeses there. So I'm going to pop back out to the main menu. And then we'll kind of go from there. Now, one of the things that uh, I'm not going to go over specifically, but but if you need to get modules, like the one we just did was a, a Sorcerer Endbringer mod, uh, you can, mm -hmm. one of the things I find that works really well is just going onto Google and searching Steam Workshop and then the name of the game that I want to try and find. And you'll usually be able to find somebody who's made a fan-based uh creation or maybe the designer in this case the designers made oh, yeah. a, a mod you can pick it up and i know there's one for sorcerer out there that you can pick up um yeah, but... it's official because uh because we bridge the time to deliver to the people uh, yes. to deliver to the game the people and uh it was mostly um uh, it was mostly um uh it was mostly uh, how to say uh it was mostly based to Corona thing, uh, but not only. Also, I I pro, uh, uh, I recommended a, a huge change uh, for the game after the Kickstarter campaign, which Rob was okay with it. Uh, um, so so all those things at the end just breached the timeline that uh, we, we had to bring the sorcerer to the people. But on the other side, Rob Rob uh, Rob provide this. The, uh, this initiative, which is which is new to our company, that you can play our game uh, uh, in advance uh, via the tabletop simulator, and mm -hmm. we also use this uh, uh, this environment uh, to to get a response from people. So it's 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 something like a beta test. Yeah. It, and I had a lot of fun testing the uh, the new decks that yeah. got released. Um, really excited about those. Oh my gosh, like playing those, they all added some really new and creative stuff to the game. So that was pretty exciting to, to see yeah, I, the new stuff. I can only agree with you. Uh, I, uh, I, I, I really bring a lot of ideas into the new stuff. I, I consider uh, the Wave 2 to be the most creative from all the sorcerer I think. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely love it. So um once once you have gotten a mod, subscribed to a mod, and you 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 have some options here when you open up tabletop simulator uh to either join a, an existing game or to create a game. Um so if you're creating a game you're basically creating a server that you're gonna host that other people can join in on. Um, whereas join, you have a buddy that says, "Hey, I've got a server up. Um, go out, go ahead and uh, find it and join me." Okay, I will. I'll show you that. Show you that first. So right now, Peter, I don't have a server up, but I'm going to show you first the join 
button and then I'll set up a server and I'll have you actually find it and join it. Yeah. I already have it, yeah, the, the, the server. So right now you can see a bunch of games out there. So if you know the name of the, the server name, you can search it in here and you can find it that way. There's also, if you're friends with somebody on Steam, you can just check the friends only box and you'll be able to find just games that your yeah. friends have up. Um, to create a server, you'll hit the create button. You'll choose whether you're doing single player, multiplayer. Hot seat I don't really use. That's if you've you've got maybe a laptop that you're passing back and forth between people that are in the same room together. Okay. Um, I'm going to set up a multiplayer one because there's going to be two of us playing. I've mm -hmm. already got max players set to two. This will also restrict if anybody tried to join the server after two people joined or in there, it wouldn't let anybody else in there. If you want to let more people in, you have to up the number of players that are allowed. Okay. Um, I'm going to make this server name. I can do whatever I want. I'm going to say if source for Endbringer is going to be the name of my server. Mm -hmm. I can have it as public where anybody can join it, but in that case, I can put on a password so that somebody needs the password to be able to get in. Or I can make it to where friends only, so only my Steam friends are able to find and, and join the server. Or mm -hmm. by invite only, which means you're not getting in unless I specifically send you an invite to join. I'm going to keep it as public. I'll just keep okay. the password I have here, which is endbringer, all one word, all lowercase. But I could make the server password whatever I wanted to make it to be. Oh. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead oh, and just give me the sorcerer with everything uh, small. What's that now? Oh, uh, just give the server pass for sorcerer with everything small. Or do you have already a password? I can I can just put it to to sorcerer. So I'll change I that. Oh yeah, perfect. That's good. And then I'm gonna click create server. Okay, I'm going to my tabletop simulator, and I will try to find it by our game. Yeah, so and sorry. what I'll do, uh, also you can see here on the screen, now I've got, I've got to choose which game I want to play in my, in my server I've got set up here. I've got a bunch of different mods that I have found and, and added. Um, I am going to click on this Sorcerer Endbringer one, since that's got all the Endbringer content that we were looking at earlier. Mm -hmm. And I'll click on Load. And then, depending on how efficient okay. your uh, laptop or PC is, it'll take a little bit to load all the game. objects. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm in the game, I think. All right, yeah, I see you here. Choose color. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the different colors, and you can always, you can click, you can left click on your name, and you can choose change color if you're already in a seat. I'm going to do that because I'm not actually, I'm, I'm not in a position that's associated with, with one of these boards. So okay. I'll go ahead and click. Oh, you got that one. I'm going to click on, I'll just take the green seat. Mm -hmm. So now we both have basically a virtual seat at the table. Mm -hmm. And now we'll kind of go through some of the basic controls that we're going to use. And I guess we'll do, we'll do that as we're kind of setting up and playing the game. So the first thing we'll want to do is to pick our sorcerers. Um, do you have any recommendations for me, Peter, of a good combo to play in this scenario? Because I'm still learning a lot of them. I've played a few of the decks maybe once or twice, but interested in a good I, combo. Everything is okay. Uh, I mean, every 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 deck is a good combo. That's the, 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 that's the pure fact. So I'm going to do, and, and I'll kind of show you the shuffle thing. Now, if you're in the mod, They've got these placeholder cards to where you can just shuffle and choose. That's what I did last time. So I'm just going to, oh, to shuffle, uh, put your put your hand over the deck that you want to shuffle. So if you want to, and then just type, tap the R key as many times as you want. And I'll just shuffle, shuffle as much as you hit the R key. R key is a shuffle. Uh, I have a question. How can I, how can I move on the, on the, on the table? The move, how can I move the camera? Oh, okay, so uh, one way is going to be your ASDW keys. That's going to move you up, down, left, and right. 
with oh, the we, we, okay, okay, I got it. And, and, with then, the, and when when I hold the shift uh, and the right mouse, I can manage the camera angle. Yes, you, in fact, you can just uh, right mouse key and you can angle the oh, camera okay. however you want. Okay, okay, and zoom is with the scroll, okay. Yep. Oh, okay, perfect, got it. Yeah, so now I'm gonna just gonna I'm gonna pick one of these cards off. The, well, I'll have you pick a card off the top. The way you want to do that, there's two ways to pick stuff up. One is if I click and hold, it'll pick up the whole deck. Oh, see, I see. If I want to draw a card off the top and pull it off the top, I just click and pull really quick to draw it off. So go ahead and see if you can pull one of those cards yeah. off. Perfect. I'm not a problem. Yeah. And now if uh, if we want to see that card, what we can do is just if you tap the F key, that'll flip the object. Yeah. Perfect. Or, so I, can, or, I, can, or I can tap the right um, around mouse and there is a action bar. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there is that too. Or, and I'll show that to everybody here. Different, different commands you have. Um, there's some interesting stuff there. We won't go through everything that's on here. But, but yeah, so you, you, that's shuffling. And, and the same button for, for uh, shuffling, that R. It's basically R for randomized. So in the same fashion, I can take dice. And if I, the easiest way is to box select. So if you take your, hold your left mouse and draw a little square over one or more dice. And once it's highlighted, just type the R key and it'll toss it up in the air. Or you can just roll. Yep, you can, you can do that too. I like to do the random just because it feels more like it gets a good randomization on it. And you can tap that R key as much as you want. And okay. it'll, it'll keep on tossing up in the air, tossing up the air until you stop tapping R and then it'll drop them. Okay, I see. I got it. Okay, perfect. Now, one keen little trick, if you're like, man, the dice don't feel as natural, they don't bounce at all, you can always, uh, one of the options when you right click on something there's physics in that menu and you can click on that and you can uh what what is the bounciness so you can change the bounciness if you increase that then it'll make the dice bounce a little bit more when they when they that hit is. the table um so that's that uh, i was going to select my character so i'm going to randomize this draw one off the top Oh, Sigismund. Awesome. Lineage. I'm going to be the Necromancer. And Domain. I am going to have the Bewitched Woodland. So what I'll do to grab these is, um, and I can let you do that. So you can click and hold on the Sigismund deck, and you can just pull it to where you want it to go. Oh, and now we just got the top card. Oh, so okay. I'm going to put that back on. Oh, you know, this guy's in the way. What I want is to get the whole deck. So if you want this whole deck, you're going to click and hold and drag. That way you'll take the whole deck with you. There we go. Oh, okay. Oh, good. Got it, got it. Okay. So I'll go ahead and grab that guy and I'll pull him over here to my play area. Okay, now mine. Ragnar. Okay. And then uh, let's see. I had Necromancer. I'll grab the Necromancer deck. Oh, another little tool I'll, I'll show you too that I was doing because when I drag it over to my player board, it's kind of sideways instead of up and down. So as I'm picking this up and holding it, I can tap the E and the Q button to rotate it. E and the Q? Yeah, the E and the Q will rotate so that I can get it to the orientation that I want. And which Woodlands? I'll grab that deck here. Oh, Royal Palace. Wow. Okay. And for those of you at home, this is this is definitely a legit way to choose your character if you're not really familiar and you just want to do a random 
you can always just shuffle up all oh, yeah. the top cards for the deck yes. and, and pick one that way. Last time I played, I had... Uh, who was I last time? I was... Uh, Wachiwi, if I'm saying that okay. right. And I yeah. was the shapeshifter. Oh, okay. And I think yeah. I was Forgotten Temple. Good combination. Uh, you, you, you basically you had a, you had a, uh, you have a Native American combo because the shapeshifter and Vachivi, Vachivi is Native Native American and the uh, and the lineage is uh, is one of the tribe based. Uh, it's Arcadian people. It's it's also a tribe based uh, Native American. So you yeah. are pretty stylish. I liked I liked that deck combo. I also yeah. I have to say too when I say when I talked earlier about the the lore in this game. Uh, oh, yeah. If you actually listen to the podcast lore, you'll you'll hear a lot of these different minions and stuff talked about. Like I know there were several from Wachiwi's deck that I heard the the, and I may be messing up the pronunciation, but the Nimrigar was one. Yeah. And what's the what's the Native American spirit that, that they've got? Uh, oh, uh, horns uh, like you, an elk. Uh, I don't, Wendigo. Wendigo, yeah, that was what I was trying to think of. So Wendigo's in her deck, I, I believe. So we're gonna take the top card off the deck, and then of course I guess I have to for Sigismund. I've got to grab off these. Coven newborns and separate those out because those will be little token cards. Oh yeah, yes. And uh, is there anything else? Because there's thirty. Oh, where right, I can get they... where I can get the the red token for my blood pool. Oh, uh, we can. Do they have these just separately here? I I know there is a oh. there is a thing that you can clone something. Yeah. So what we can do? I know we want one of these little red cubes, right? So right click that red cube. Uh -huh. And you can either click on the clone button. It's not active. Oh, that's uh, right me. because you know what? Let me give you I've I've got to give you permissions to be able to do that. So I'm going to promote you. Okay. So that now you'll have a little bit more access to oh, awesome. mess with it. Awesome. Okay, so I will clone the one and I got it. Okay, perfect. And then just right click again to get the clone tool off or otherwise you'll just keep on clicking and getting more yeah. cubes <laughs> I, just, I just find out <laughs> i just find out okay so i will put it here all right let's see yeah. i got my and then okay so that's sigismund this one i don't have to remove anything this one i don't have to remove anything from so what i'm going to do is i'm going to click and hold i'm going to drop this one on top of this one and then I'm going to click and hold again and drop this on top of this. Awesome. And then uh, one gonna... important thing is uh, then uh, when you will, uh, when uh, for the people that do not know the sorcerer, uh, um, you have, when you build the, those three decks, and you will uh, uh, you will put it in uh, in this order that from, that, that uh, as, as you choose, so basically character, Lineage and domain, you will get the name. So, for instance, I have I am a Ragnar, the Blood Lord of the Royal Palace. <laughs> yes, and I am Sigismund, the Necromancer of the Bewitched Woodland. Okay, <laughs> what, what name is this? <laughs> so I no, will I will let you assemble your deck here. Yep, and you can just click and hold and put the other. Because this one's still missing, so flip oh, that, okay. put that in, and give it yeah. another shuffle there. Yeah. And I'll flip mine over and give it a shuffle, and then we can. It's put more it in. easier than I thought it will be. I mean, the the managing of the of the tabletop simulator, it's it's great when you when you know how to use it, it's perfect to play in it. Yeah, once you get the hang of it, it's good. It's just getting some basic controls, and then let's see. I'll move my these little guys over here, and then I got these. Um, was it the uh, havens that how I can? can I zoom, how can I zoom the object that I am on it? Ah, okay. So a couple of different ways. The basic way is 
press the Alt key while you're hovering over an object, and oh, then use your mouse wheel to scroll in further oh, if you need okay. to zoom in. Further. And also, uh, uh, how much you will scroll it, it will it will remember uh, the scroll size. Yes. So yeah, perfect. That's amazing. And That's then amazing. Uh, another tool is the M key gives you like a magnifying glass that you can okay. just move around the table and look with the magnifying glass. Wow, that's perfect. Okay, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, amazing. I don't use the magnifying glass quite as much, but it, it's kind of a nice <laughs> resource to, to know that you have. Okay. Right. It's cool, it's cool. I love it. So now the thing we're going to do is part of our setup. I know we got to draw six starting cards out of our deck. So the way that you can draw cards in your hand, now you can obviously pull one off the top uh -huh. And let's see if there should be down here, there should be like a hand area. It's kind of invisible. Uh, so if you. Oh, and I see. Yeah, I got it. I, I got it. Okay, okay perfect. I, I, I know. And actually, yeah, I'm going to is... take, take and move your deck over to your board because this is kind of your board area here. Oh, and then I guess I should take your, your stuff here. Oh, maybe I won't. Maybe I'll just. I guess it doesn't really matter. You can have your hand over here and still sit in that seat, or I can just move you. Let me do this. Let me move you over here. I'm gonna grab all these cards and put them there. Okay. Okay, got it. Yeah. And also the grimoire. Now the the other way to do this, and I'm just gonna take these cards really quick. I'm gonna box select them out of your hand. I'm gonna grab them out of your hand, and I'm going to. Oh, here, I'm gonna drop them back on your deck maybe and i'm going to bring this deck over here the other way oh, to draw me. cards and this is a good one so you want to draw six cards hover over the deck and type the number six on your keyboard and you'll just oh. draw automatically the number of cards you type okay and what's this one? Oh, this is this is mine let me put that back in here and shuffle them in i'll draw myself six cards one question we had, Peter, when we were playing, should the sure. players basically be playing open-handed so it's open information, or are you um, restricted know, in sharing? Uh, no. What is what's important to know, lore wise that we are friends of necessity. We are still <laughs> rivals. We, we are still rivals after it. So what does it mean mechanically? We are not showing our hands, and we are not playing attachments or Armenians. I am not playing attachment on your minions. I see. That makes sense. It's like we are, uh, it's kind of the. We are, we are still enemies. Yeah, <laughs> it's just right now we've got a bigger problem to deal with, so yeah, we'll work I together till we get this guy out of the way. Yeah, I think it's the allies of necessity. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. So we we played open handed last time, but I don't even think I really looked at my teammates' cards at all during the game. I just kind of kept yeah, my uh, eyes on my own I hand. think you can play open. Uh, uh, do not play even with the, with the newcomers with open hand. So because there is a there is a tendency to to be an alpha player. Yeah, true. Yeah, you don't want somebody quarterbacking the game. Exactly, now, you'll yeah. you'll notice, too, right now, if you look over at my hand of cards next to you over here, um, mm -hmm. you can't see them. You can only see the back. I can okay. see the front. If I so wanted, you are not seeing my cards right now, right? Right. I can't see your cards. You can't see mine. Okay. If okay. you wanted to do something where all players could see everybody's cards, you can make uh -huh. teams. And so what you do okay. to do that, if you go up to your name in the upper right corner and you right-click it, there's a menu option up there that says Change Team. Oh, I see. You can click that, and you can choose whatever team you oh, want. So you could be Team Hearts, Team Jokers, whatever I you see. want. And then no, we are, I, not, we are not, not, not a team. Right. And then what would happen is if, if we were on the same team, I'd change my team to the same team as yours, and then we could see each other's stuff. Uh, just, just, just to add a thing about our cooperation we still need to cooperate. Uh, so basically, we need to discuss our, our ter It's nothing like we are playing Lone Wolf right now because yeah. we are allies of necessity. No, we are still allies. Uh, so we need to cooperate to, to beat it. 
Gotcha. Uh, so yeah, so you're you're. Wait, the more players are in the game, the more the more hard will be to win because uh, this is not a game that you can play um, like mindless mindlessly. You yes. can easily get into the situation by a bad uh, by a bad uh, evaluation of the situation. And the yeah. more player uh, is playing, there is a there is a more space to to do mistakes. Uh, I think there is a threshold for a mistakes, but if you are playing like mindlessly, I think you will not you will not win it even with luck. Yeah, yeah, you've got to you've got to still kind of coordinate a little bit of course. and yeah. talk talk things <laughs> through. Like I taking what battlefield. Or when we need to make a more pressure and so on. Yeah. Um, another tool I thought of that I wanted to tell you about: if you if you hover over somewhere in the board and you click the tab key, it'll make a little ding and it'll put an arrow. So if you want to say, "Hey, Rick, look at this," you can tab over it, and I'll see where your arrow is, and then I'll know where you're looking. Okay. So that's and a I'll handy tool. Get of, how to get rid of the arrow? It just goes away on its own. It'll flash for a little bit and then it'll disappear. Ah, okay, I see. I see. Okay, I see. And uh, okay, I need to. Uh, how 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 I can get rid of the of the function? Uh, so you got how that I... ruler. So up in on the left, there's a toolbar there. You'll just want to click on the hand. Ah, okay. And that'll okay. get you back to your hand. Yeah, good. All right. Um. I will, if I think of anything else as we go, I think those are some of the basic tools of being able to shuffle and roll dice, um, being able to pick up objects and move them and flip them. Um, oh, yeah, we, we can we can stick into just the base level. Oh, I think one, we are, oh, yeah. This, this doesn't matter as much for these dice because they're not numerical, but if you want to just change the face to a certain side, you could type the number of that side. So like this is one, two, three, four, five. I can also use the Q and E keys to flip from one side to the other. Got it. So, all right. So now I guess we need to set up our nemesis. And I'm going to do what I did the other day. I'm going to take these rule books and I'm going to move them up here so I have more room on the board to set up my nemesis stuff. And I'm going to semi go for memory, but or actually I should I should let you since I'm teaching you how to manipulate stuff, I should let you set up our nemesis situation so that you can practice picking up objects, moving them, setting things up, shuffling all that. Okay, okay, got it. Uh okay, so I am picking up the Erling can. Okay. Uh Oh, and uh, here's another thing that's handy. So okay. if you want to grab multiple things at once, like you just want to grab all his stuff, you can oh, box select. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah, when okay. you box select, yeah, you just grab everything. Okay. Um, and when you have a box selected too, you can rotate. I see. Yeah. I, I, everything that's at exactly, once. That's exactly what I want to do right now. Perfect. Uh, do we have a perfect space for it? I where I was setting them up. Let's see. I'll take. We'll move this guy in a second. But I was just setting them up up here above the battlefields. Okay. And so we have this card, and then we'll set his um his army card here. And if we do a scenario, we'll set that up to the right of that. Got it. Okay, and I will put all those things. Uh, when we okay, I I will manage it as I should do it on the manual things. All so right. uh, I am usually putting the 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 monsters here. Uh, also with the back. Uh, what is this? Oh, I, okay, those, those are, are the monoliths. Uh, yeah, that's the monoliths. Monoliths. Oh, okay. Uh, so we will put monoliths for now here, and we will put the the rule book here. 
Okay, so what's that? Okay, those are the hate counters. I see. So okay, and then the last thing we will make a scenario, of course. I will recommend to all of you when you are after 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 the first game, I am recommending using scenario because it's a beautiful mechanic and it will not bring too much into the game because it, it do not have any deck of its own. Because there is a monster deck that is uh, connected to the archetype, there is an action deck which re is connected to the nemesis, but the scenario does not have any deck. It, 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 it does give you some rules that will happen at the end of the round, and it will give you a beautiful flavor into the game. And I notice a lot of them too, they, they kind of give a game timer. Like on this one, if you don't win exactly. by round six, you're exactly. done. Yeah. Exactly. And each of those three uh, will give you the, the monoliths. So there is a monolith also for... Uh, so three, three, and I cannot see archetype monolith cards. Here's uh, Ehrlich's monolith card. Ehrlich right? monolith, okay, I see. So, uh, I will, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to handle the, the things. No, no uh, problem. This is great practice. So, okay, I will flip it here. Okay, so... All of those three cards that we that we okay this this counter I don't know what this counter is, but uh, what I want to tell is all of those three oversized cards, which means the nemesis, the archetype, and the scenario, will give you three monolith cards. You will you will take all those monolith cards together, have a good shuffle. Uh, so need to flip it down. Have a good shuffle and give one monolith to each battlefield based on the player count. So we are playing how much players do we, do we have? I guess we got are two we players, so Okay. So okay, so we will we will be two players, so two monoliths on the on the on each battlefield. You will put it and have a good shuffle on it. Just a second, so shuffle, shuffle, and two monoliths on the last one. Okay, so shuffle, and we will put monoliths here, so we will have a beautiful pictures of our battlefields. Okay, All right. Okay, and those three remaining monoliths you can set aside. I will put it here. Okay, right now we need to put uh, Endbringer, which means this big cardboard uh, this big cardboard component, uh, uh, which also be a big cardboard part in the in the in the physical copy. Um, Rick, there is a new rule uh, which will be, which will be adjusted in uh, in the uh, in the rule book. So even mm -hmm. on the beginning of the game, you will you will uh, you will find out where you will put him randomly. So you can throw okay. the uh, D8. So you can throw the D8, and you will see. Oh, okay, so five minutes is going here. All right. Okay, so one to four, he's going when the red bag is, uh, and uh, uh, wow, five six to eight. eight. Uh, yeah, it's it's where the black bag is. Okay. Uh, okay, one important thing. In Endbringer, you do not need this. Ah, uh, yeah, I remember there, us talking there's about. There's nothing like a tracking of the this uh, those those battlefields are usable in the in the versus uh, variant of the sorcerer, but those you just flip. Ah, uh, and How here's you... here's another here's another trick, another couple of tricks. Number one, oh. we don't need all these red cubes, right? So what you can do is you can box select those red cubes and then hit the delete key, and we'll just get rid of them if we don't need them for anything else. I will, I will do it. Just a second. Delete. Okay. They are out. Why there are two left? There delete. You. Okay. And then the uh, other the other thing that uh, is handy. These boards right now are locked to the table. If you okay. hit the L key, you can lock and unlock boards. And once you unlock it, then you'll be able to flip it. Okay.
So the, the you'll hit the L key over top of it when you're hovering. Oh, over top. L, uh, L key, yep. okay. And now you'll be able to flip them. And then you, if you want, you can hit the L key over them again once you flip them to lock them back to the table. So well, that's kind of handy. So so objects don't go anywhere that you want to stay fixed. That's great. That's great. That's great. I love it. Okay. Now there is nothing like. Uh, yeah, you, there there is no defense track right now. Okay, that's that's the, that's the good point of it. And also, it brings you the atmosphere and everything is destroyed yeah, now. It's so and, cool. it's, and yeah, nice. Yeah, and the same thing is true with our player boards. They're right now they're locked to the table. Also, the cool thing I noticed, I just noticed this uh, when we played last. But with the player boards, you hover over it, you'll notice it has that little one and slash two in parentheses. Okay. And it's got that little symbol above it. That means that it has basically like pages more or less. So if you right click it, if there's a state, that's what it's called. Uh, you right click the board and you go hover over the state menu. If you were to go to state two, it would be the opposite side of the board where it's got the Egyptian theme to it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's the four of four. That's for the left handed players. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so I thought that was pretty cool. And let's see. So we got our battlefield set up. We've got our monoliths. Um, we've got yeah, our favorite. our rage Jeez. tokens here for Khan. I'll put them over by him. Uh huh. And then we have our our. Now, okay, did... right now we need to check out if there is any spawning uh, spawning restrictions of the damage card. So uh, we need to check out the setup uh, uh, in the rulebook. And so we need what... to check out the setup for those. So what we'll do, we got the rulebook over here up at the top. Um, you can either just flip through the pages by clicking here. One thing I like to do, if you right click on the rulebook, there's an option to pop out. And then you'll get like a little side screen with the rule book that you can page through to specific pages a little bit more easily and okay you can also when you have the rule book on the table you can click a number on the number keypad and you can flip to that page in the rule book got it okay so we need to check out we place the monoliths, uh, and we need to check out the setup instruction for the early can. Early can, I think, does not have any. So okay, we have an uh, we, oh, we have he, this. He gets one hate counter on his sheet, so I'll put that on there. Place one hate counter on early can. Okay, correct, perfect. Um, then there is a. Uh, Okay, by, by the way, uh, in each, uh, under each, each name, you can see the complexity. So the hypnosis has the highest complexity. It's complexity, it's not difficulty, complexity. Yeah, just more stuff to manage with the higher complexity. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Uh, so we have right now the Demiurge, which is medium complexity. Uh, put the evil of rule cards on the table for reference. Put all the evil of counters within the reach of each players. Put them backside of a mix. Okay, so yeah, that's it. That's it. So there is nothing like a spawning uh, rule and so on. So we can just play. And during the setup, we will spawn uh, minions based on the player count. So I will spawn uh, two minions uh, on the left battlefield. Oh, I will put monoliths like this way. No, should this uh, should this deck be shuffled? Yes, sorry. Yes, this will be flip down and shuffle, and then we will spawn the minions on each battlefield. One one minion per battlefield per player. Mm -hmm. uh, so we will spawn two on each battlefield. Uh, okay, two of each battlefield. And this is early Khan's deck, so we will put him aside of him. That's the point. And now we can just flip the guys. 
the damage is perfect because they do not have any effects. What is important, I speak also with Rado. Uh, I don't know if you know Richard Ham, uh, Rado. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Uh, we spoke with him and we played like five years ago. <laughs> Uh, not exactly this design, but uh, close to that. And he told me that uh, at first we have a minions that have that have a, a text on them. So it was it was a huge deal to check all those setup uh, effects on the cards. In this design, you can see also in the dead dealer and so on that minions that will spawn at the beginning of the game has no effect on it. So there is nothing you need to track right now. You you just check out uh, their attack, their defense, and that's it. There is nothing you need to upkeep right now. That's the good thing. You can focus on your hand. Nice. Yeah, uh, I am just speaking about the about the about the design decisions, uh, which is something like a behind the scenes thing. Consider it like yeah. this way. Yeah, and these are all cool looking. I've only played with the two times I've played. I've only played with the um, uh, the uh, the uh, the Death Dealer. Yeah, when you check the Death Dealer, uh, he is spawning at the beginning of the game. Those guys that is on the top, and when you check it, he has only a flavor text on it. Yeah, and those guys are a pain in the butt because you can't initially kill them unless you roll a crit. <laughs> I know. <laughs> or, also... or you will have some effects. Yeah. I mean, I can right now. I can, uh, I can tell you if you want to have a game a little bit more easier, take up the demonologist. Yes. Demonologist is just a he's a smasher in this game. I mean, in the end, bring a demonologist is like a he's a huge killer. At the end of the game, at the end of the each round, you will just kill all those guys with the yeah. with the burn tokens on it. That's what that's my friend uh -huh. was had the demonologist, and yeah, it was cool to put flame tokens on those. Uh, okay, minions. but there is a kickback. Uh, demonologist has a really bad omen token gen mm. gen generator, uh, so he is not generating too much omens. So. It has a kickback and yeah. early can have pretty nasty conditions, uh, which 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 uh, ongoing effects which you you need to deal with the omens. So it's a situation you need to consider. But definitely, uh, the demonologist is pretty pretty good in the Endbringer. Yeah, we we had a combination of him plus Seth plus the. Uh... The Godforsaken Church. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that, that's the thing I told about. Uh, when you have a problems with the omens, take Zevrain. Oh, of course, if you are not knowing all those sets, of course you need to get to know it. But I know that Zevrain is producing a lot of omens. So I, if I need an omens, I will take Zevrain or the Bewitch Mountain. If I need to kill to kill many. Uh, many minions with the uh, with the uh, essence of one. I will probably choose the demonologist. Mm -hmm. So so that's the mindset of the game. You need to master out what is what is comfortable for for the for the end bringer scenario and what will make your game even more easier. When I want to uh, to have a game more challenging, I will not pick up this how to say easy picks. Yeah, and I will make it more challenging. So this is something like a toolbox for you when you will get master the game, when you will just adjust the difficulty exactly how you want to be. Yeah, and what I was telling my friend the the other day is for me who I don't get to play that much where I huh? where I live now with this solo mode, I can try out deck combinations and right. and see the synergies and see how they work. Yeah, that's that's the. That's the beautiful part of the thing. Speaking of my perspective, of course, I really enjoying when I am deep diving into game and try to find out combinations and so on. That's the part I love most on the games. And yeah. speaking of solo play, that means like a double time. 
I, I mean, the truth for this uh, fact is that it's just double. Yeah. Just looking at my um, re refamiliarizing myself with my my covens that I have. Okay. Sure. I played this deck once and test. I when I tested it, I did an all vampire deck. <laughs> I did Stigisman, uh yeah. the Blood Lord um, one, and the uh, Blood Curse ship. Yes, right now, uh, I want to have all those re really strong archetypes to be uh, to to have their own deck. So basically, we started right now with the vampires. So you can you can go full vampire. Uh, yeah. Then uh, I I need somebody like a dead person to go full zombie. Okay, you can have a Zevrain, which is a half a half dead body guy, mm -hmm. but he, he does not have zombies in it. Uh, but there is a Bewitch Mountain linear uh, domain which have a zombies, and we have a necromancer. So you can go nearly full necromancy. So maybe this is a hint for future sets. That there will be a zombie character or a character <laughs> with zombies. So also there is a Merlin, which is the forest guy, something like a ant or something like that. And when you will take out, uh, pick up the Sylvanae, and then the domain which called the new one, the Bewitch Forest, you can you yes. can go full forest. <laughs> yeah, full nature deck. Exactly. Yeah, I, I love that. One thing, one thing I'll say too, Peter. I know like. I probably spent way more time than we planned on up front just talking to you about the game. If you have a hard cutoff at any point, let me know because we can just play until you have to stop and we can cut off at any time just to give people a, a you know a taste of the game. Oh yeah, sure. It's uh, the same goes to you. I have a I have a time for this, so it's not a problem. We can enjoy the game. And of course, it's up to you. If you want to cut out, just feel free. All right. Uh, so, do we have any setup that we have to do with the um, the last card, the scenario card? No, no, no. There. Okay. With scenario cards, there is no setup. Scenario okay. has 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 only a basic rule. It happened. Each of those little amber cubes. Uh, means that you will track it the, the rounds with it. So we can put one red cube on it. Oh, okay, I guess we shouldn't have deleted all. But fortunately, we still have your red cube for your vampire deck. I'll just clone that real quick. Yeah, and you way. can put it uh, put it on the scenario card somewhere. We need only one. Oh, yeah. I don't know how I got two there, but yeah. Let's put problem. that off to the side in case we okay. find a need so for it. Basically, at the end of the round, we will just progress the scenario of the of it. That's that's the each, each scenario working like this. There is nothing to add more than only progressing every turn with the effect. That's the point of scenario. It not to be need to be afraid of, so it will not bring you any setup. Excellent. So then we've we're basically set up to play then, right? Because we've got we've got our nemesis and we've got Erlikon all set up. I yeah. think we've done the setup for the demiurge. We just had to grab the the card which we have over here in these tokens, which I guess the tokens are actually in this bag. Yeah, that's it. Uh, so. the game is game is designed to be easy to set up. The yeah. setup will not take more than a few minutes. And we've got our health counter set up correctly. It's 30 health per player, so right now 60 is what yeah. we need, so we're good there. Yeah, yeah. So if you want to, if you want to win the game pretty, pretty badly, just add additional 31. <laughs> 30 yeah, that's health. true. That's a good. That's a good um, difficulty adjuster too. Is just messing with. But the, I the do not health. recommend it. It's not how it's designed. You need to yeah. <laughs> just lose it at the beginning. Sorry. <laughs> all right yeah so i think everything is set up so uh -huh. one question i had too i'll ask it now with with the battlefields is it the same as the base game where you can only have four on each side of the battlefield no that's not correct oh uh, really <laughs> you, have, you have you have a limit of four 
in the lim in the solo play on on our side. Right now, when we are playing two uh, in two player mode, we have a six cap. So on our side, there is a capacity of the six minions per battlefield. When okay. three players are playing, they have a capacity of the eight. Okay. And on the other side, there is no limit for the nemesis. So uh, <laughs> that's interesting because we made the game a little bit easier on ourselves because we thought, oh, yeah, it's probably still the same limit for the nemesis. And so when the nemesis had oh, four guys oh. in a battlefield and he was supposed to spawn stuff, we're like, oh, yeah, that's all right. He can't spawn. He's already got max capacity. Oh, sir. He will spawn. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, that would have been even worse. <laughs> but, all right. So uh, all that is set. I'm going to go ahead and put my, my guy in the middle battlefield. Yeah, I, I, will, I, will, I will leave Ragnar where he is. Uh, don't forget that uh, tactics only happen where the uh, where the nemesis is. Yeah, and that's important right? too because that was one thing we were forgetting when we moved into the battlefields where the nemesis was. We were forgetting to do the yeah. tactics sometime, and then we were having to like kind of rewind time and oh, try and catch everything up. Yeah. yeah. So all right. Um, I'm going to let you, if you're all right with it, I'm going to let you be first player and kind of kick things off here. Not a problem, gladly. Uh, okay. Oh, okay, I will start. 